The last lesson focused on acyclic conjugated pi systems. Interesting things start happening when we tie the ends of an acyclic pi system together, creating a cyclic conjugated system. These structures have the potential to be aromatic, which is a special type of stability that comes into certain types of cyclic pi systems. In this lesson, we're going to put the prototypical aromatic compound, benzene, under the microscope, looking at some historical proposals for the structure of benzene and a modern description of benzene structure that takes advantage of resonance and molecular orbital theory. We'll also look at aromatic hydrocarbons more broadly, at the general criteria for aromaticity that apply across the board, and at a nice mnemonic for drawing molecular orbital diagrams of aromatic hydrocarbons that helps us assess whether a particular molecule is aromatic, non-aromatic, or anti-aromatic, and we'll see what these terms mean throughout this lesson. Finally, we'll take a look at different types of aromatic hydrocarbons, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons containing fused benzene rings, and annulenes, which are larger structures consisting of alternating single and double carbon-carbon bonds. When it comes to organic structures, I think benzene is one of the most intrinsically interesting molecules in all of organic chemistry. Nowadays, we take for granted that the structure of benzene looks something like this, and it's characterized by two resonance structures that differ in the positions of the double bonds. This is actually a relatively rare structural pattern if you really think about it. We've got two resonance forms that are both neutral, that are equivalent, meaning that the true structure is a perfect hybrid, 50% and 50% of these two structures. This structure of benzene and the corresponding resonance hybrid, which shows that the bond order of all carbon-carbon bonds is 1.5, was by no means taken for granted early in the history of organic chemistry. And there was actually a lot of debate over the true structure of the benzene molecule all the way up into the middle of the 20th century. Even the earliest of organic chemists understood that there was something unique about the benzene molecule. They noticed, for example, that it's unreactive under reaction conditions that would normally engage alkenes. And so it's not really accurate to call benzene an alkene then despite the fact that it contains carbon-carbon double bonds within its structure. Later it became apparent that the molecule is symmetric, which seems incompatible with, for example, this structure by itself, considering that some of the bonds appear to be single bonds and some of the bonds appear to be double bonds. What studies showed is that all six carbons of benzene are equivalent and all six bonds within the benzene molecule are equivalent. Proposals for the structure of benzene had to be consistent with these observations and with any other data that was available on the nature of benzene, such as spectroscopic data. Fairly early in the history of organic chemistry, rules were being developed for the way organic structures behaved and, and how they appeared, what bonding patterns existed, and how things connected to each other, and so on and so forth. Benzene seemed to violate some of these rules. And for this reason, the structure of benzene was hotly debated in the early history of organic chemistry. This was before the introduction of molecular orbital theory, so we couldn't pop the molecule into some quantum chemistry software and see the molecular orbitals and optimized geometry that came out. All that the early organic chemists had to go on were qualitative observations of the behavior of benzene and chemical reactions, and information that could be readily gleaned from stoichiometry, like the molecular formula. Benzene does not react in electrophilic addition reactions when it's treated with electrophiles like Br2. Instead, benzene gives substitution products, and only in the presence of a catalyst that accelerates the reaction. It was known very early on that the molecular formula of benzene is C6H6, and with just these two pieces of information to go on, a number of proposals were put forth about the structure of benzene. Some of them are shown for you here. Some of these look ridiculous in the rear view mirror, especially given, for example, nuclear magnetic resonance, which would allow us to rule out Huckel's benzvalene structure because it has distinct types of hydrogens within it. And for example, the NMR structure of benzene has only one peak. The structures by Klaus and Dewar have bonds that cut across the six-membered ring, which don't make much sense geometrically, but try to illustrate ideas of electron delocalization that were brewing in these chemists' minds even before molecular orbital theory became known. Leidenberg's trigonal prism structure is one of my favorites because this molecule actually does have six homotopic hydrogen atoms within it. And so ignoring things like hybridization and what the ideal bond angle would have to be for these carbons within this structure. From a spectroscopic perspective, this is going to look a lot like benzene. Ultimately, the person who came closest was a chemist named Kekulé, who proposed the now familiar alternating single and double bond six-membered ring structure of benzene 
in the 1800s. But Kekulé wasn't exactly right. He knew that this structure was incomplete, but he proposed that there was a rapid equilibrium between this structure and what we would now recognize as the alternative resonance form of benzene with the double bonds located in alternative positions. He felt, for example, that at low enough temperatures we should be able to isolate one or the other of these isomers, and he felt that they were constitutional isomers. However, later experiments and, and all the evidence since Kekulé's time has shown that this is not actually an equilibrium between two structures. One piece of more empirical evidence for this that we can latch on to is this idea that engages substituted benzene, such as 1,2-bromobenzene. If Kekulé's idea is correct, there should be two isomers of 1,2-dibromobenzene differing in the positions of the double bonds. If, in fact, there's an equilibrium between these two isomers, then we should be able to observe them distinctly in a spectroscopic sense as the bonds are different, right? So, for example, this bond I'm highlighting and this bond should give different signatures in an infrared spectrum since one is a double bond and one is a single bond. And we should be able to isolate one or the other of these isomers, just as in the benzene case above. Here again, this isn't what's observed. And so while Kekulé was definitely on the right track with his alternating single and double bond structure, he was missing the key idea of electron delocalization that's essential to the structure of benzene. All that said, I think he did a pretty good job considering that he came up with, the, with this structure long before resonance was invented as a concept. In the early days, the concept of aromaticity was essentially invented to apply to these compounds that give substitution products rather than addition products when treated with electrophiles, even though they were heavily unsaturated, implying that they contained double bonds. But there's more to aromaticity than just alternating single and double bonds. Take, for example, the related molecule cyclobutadiene, which looks a lot like benzene. It just contains four carbons instead of six. This precursor looks like it has the potential to form cyclobutadiene through an elimination type process, especially under pyrolytic conditions, which basically just means heat the crap out of it until it breaks apart. However, under pyrolysis conditions, cyclobutadiene is not observed starting from this precursor. And it's actually extremely difficult to synthesize cyclobutadiene, even from something like a cyclobutyl dihalide that we would expect to readily give this molecule upon elimination conditions. So despite the fact that this appears conjugated, and it certainly is, this molecule is remarkably unstable. There's more to aromaticity than just alternating double and single bonds. Cyclooctatetraene, on the other hand, looks like yet another conjugated molecule with alternating single and double bonds. And so we might expect it to behave like benzene behaves, for example, in reactions with electrophiles like Br2. However, when you take cyclooctatetraene and treat it with Br2, one of its double bonds behaves just like a plain vanilla double bond in an alkene. Addition has occurred. And what this means is that, at least according to the empirical definition of aromatic compounds as those that give substitution rather than addition products when treated with, for example, Br2, this is not an aromatic compound. The reason for this is that its structure violates one of the essential criteria for aromaticity, that the molecule be planar. Cyclooctatetraene is a non-planar molecule, and there's a very good reason for this that we'll discuss when we talk about the criteria for aromaticity in more detail in a later video.